I want to open in Isaiah 59 to kind of give a bit of context to the topic for today, uh, which is called Cities of Ash. In Isaiah 59, starting with verse 14, this was divinely ordained because uh, this was Pastor Taj's opening verse too. All right, starting with verse 14. Actually, okay, I'll read it. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth fails, and he that departs from evil makes himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. If you have NKJV, it says there was no justice. It goes on and it says, and he saw that there was no man. And wondered that there was no intercessor. Now, this here is obviously a cry for justice. You know, people look and say, you know, why this and this? Why? What about the children that are starving in Africa? Or, you know, what's happening to the little babies in Iraq? Or the ones that are being persecuted in the Middle East? Everyone has why questions. How come the, what's this hurricane? Hurricane Irma. You know, what about the tsunami in Indonesia? What about this and what about that? And so when people say why, it's a cry for justice. They want to see how is this fair, right? That's really what they're saying. How is this fair that this is happening to these innocent people? People will never ask why when a murderer is put in jail. I don't think anyone ever says why because they know why. So deep within us, we have a cry for justice. We want things to be fair. Now, how do we know this is natural? What do kids say? Say you, you're a parent, you give one a treat and the other one doesn't get. Or, or you give one this big and the other one gets one that size. Hey, that's not fair. They have a concept of justice, don't they? They're like, come on, you know. <laughs> they want to see justice. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly, unless they feel like it's in their favor. All right, now, to be honest with you, this, I think, is the biggest objection for people to say there is no God. They feel like, man, if there is God, how come this is happening? Now, I want you to turn to the book of Judges, chapter 6, and you'll find it interesting that this idea of suffering and justice that question, why, doesn't just affect atheists. It also affects believers in a very deep way. And many of you would be familiar with this story. Judges chapter 1, chapter 6, sorry, verse 1. I'm sure you're all familiar. I hope you're familiar with the story of Gideon. Evening, Tracy. Now, here's how it goes. It says, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So it was when Israel had sown, planted, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, all of their crops, till thou comest unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey, nothing. They totally took everything. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Sounds like Persia versus Greece or Persia versus Babylon. The Persians were known for being hordes and hordes. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel did what? They cried out to God because of the injustice that was happening here. To say, Lord, come on. You know, everything they tried to do to plant was totally plundered. Now, my kids this morning, not this morning, this morning, this evening, 
They were building a, a tower of cups, paper cups. And every time they got it big, I've got a one-year-old daughter. She came and she was like, <laughs> knock it over, you know. And you can imagine ah, the frustration that they had, you know. As you're trying to progress, every little effort is plundered. Now, that's just a game. Imagine that was an actual building you were trying to build for your family to dwell in. And then people just come and knock it over when you're almost there, you know. And this actually happened to the children of Israel after they came out of Babylon when they were trying to rebuild and the progress was hindered. Anyway, you get the context here that they're really trying their best and it just keeps being taken away by force. So they cry unto God. And so God picks this man called Gideon. So I just want to read um, from verse 11 to verse 13 just to give a bit of a perspective here of what's going on because God rose up this man a mighty man according to the angel it says they came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was in Ophrah which pertained unto Joash the Abbas right and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him the Lord is with you thou mighty man of valor now Here's Gideon's response in verse 13. He says, if the Lord is with us, why? You see that? If God is with us, then why has all this befallen us? What is his reflection? He's thinking, man, if God is with us, right, we should be prospering and everything should be all perfect, right? And here... You know, he goes on and he says, you know, we've heard about all these miracles. Where are all the miracles? You know, how come he's not parting the Red Sea right now? You know, where are the plagues to defend us? Right? And this is the experience, I guess, for a lot of people that, you know what? It may not be this grand scale, but in your personal life, you might be going through a storm, you know? Maybe you've got a massive heart surgery coming up. And sometimes in your mind, you think, Lord, why is this happening to, to me? Maybe you've gone through a big family disaster. Lord, why is this happening to me? If God is with me, why is this happening? So people begin to question, right? Is God really there? Is he really watching out for me? You know what I'm saying? And so here we're brought to really ponder the justice of God. You know, where is God when these things are happening? What is God going to do about it? All right. Here we are. Who can be against us? He got it. That's right. Now, I want to ask you, has anyone ever been bullied? Be honest. Herbert? Anyone else? Clive? Cheryl? <laughs> yeah, I was bullied. I remember my last year of um, primary school. The last year of primary school, I was actually the deputy head boy, and I was bullied by this big, strong boy. Now, I want you to be honest for a second. When you're bullied, or if your younger sister or brother is bullied, how do you feel? Yeah. Has anyone ever stood up against a bully? Okay. I'll tell you what I did. Now, this is not a Christian recommendation. But I kicked the guy in the shin and I ran away because I was tired of being bullied. And he never bullied me again after that. <laughs> That's not the recommendation I have. But there was a cry for justice to say something's got to happen, right? Let's just be honest here, in a natural sense, how much sympathy do we have for bullies when they have their revenge? How much sympathy do we have? Not a lot of sympathy, to be honest. Why? Because they're getting what they a taste of their own medicine, of what they were inflicting on someone else. And that's why we don't tend to sympathize with them very often. Now, imagine the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Where the Bible paints a picture where, maybe you can flick there, 
um, in Genesis, and this kind of opens up our first question, right? Now, when it says the destruction of the wicked, right, the reality is what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Now, this was a direct act of God. Now, the question is why, right? Why? Now, this doesn't paint a full picture of what was happening in Sodom, right? You're going to have to read Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 20 to get a, a broad picture of exactly what the situation was there. But Here's basically just a glimpse of what was going on in Sodom. And just like when the Israelites, they cried to God and God sent them Gideon to deliver them. Here's what's happening in Sodom. Uh, Genesis 18 and verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. All right. Now, why do you think it uses the term cry? Hmm? Is this like a party cry? There's just so much noise coming out from Sodom. They're having great parties. Why do you think it uses the term cry? Desperation. Why do you cry? Why do you cry? You're hurt. It's overwhelming. You're frustrated. Why are they crying? Now, do you think everyone is crying? No. If everyone was crying, then not everyone would be dis you know, you know what I'm saying. There was a cry here, right? And the cry is coming from who? The bully or the bullied? The bullied, right? The bullied is crying, saying, Lord, what are you going to do? Help us. That first question gives us a context. He says, what two cities are given as an example for the destruction of the wicked? What's the answer? Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. Now, it points it to be the destruction of the wicked. Why? Because they were oppressing the, the righteous, right? And so the righteous cry out to God. That's why it says that the cry of it is very grievous. So they were crying out to God, and God directly intervened, right? And this is really the case. And so even though I know these days people are, are compelled to sympathize, but the reality is that if you were the one being bullied, would you sympathize with the bully after he's been punished by the principal? Would you? If your daughter was murdered, would you sympathize with the murderer? If your daughter was raped, would you sympathize with the rapist? No. That's the point here that you have to take a stand for justice, and that means justifying the innocent, condemning the guilty, in, in this sense. That's exactly what was happening in the case of Sodom, that God had said, that's enough. All right. Now, we're going to progress. The next question here, it says, when will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? Now, that's a good question. Does anyone know what the answer to that is? When will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? Because we're talking about justice here, right? Now, let's say God decided, look, let's just destroy all the wicked, right? If he did that now, where would we run to if you were one of the righteous? If he did what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah, if he's doing that in, for the whole world, where would you run? Do you get the logic that if he's going to punish the whole world, then in this very room, we don't know who's righteous, who's wicked. God knows. But if there happens to be some, if it's me, and God sends fire, you guys will all suffer for the sake of the one wicked in your midst. Do you see the logic here? That Lot was told to flee. Get out. Get out from there because otherwise you're going to die with them. So then, if God has to do that right now, we would all perish. So, when do you think he would do it? Turn to Matthew 13. And, in fact, um, there are serious cries for justice. I'm telling you, there's some serious atrocities happening in the world. And people are wondering 
where is God in all of this? And I just want to tell you that God is watching it and he's probably more grieved than we are. Okay, we're back. All right. Now, Matthew chapter 13. Forgive me for not reading the whole, um, the whole story. I'm hoping that you guys are familiar with it. It's the par parable of the wheat and the tears and the enemy that came and sowed. So it, it goes like this. There was a, a sower went to sow, right? And he sowed good seed in his field. But while he slept, an enemy came and sowed weeds in his field, right? Among the, the wheat. So then the servants come as the, the, they start sprouting and they say, hey, didn't you sow wheat? Where do the weeds come from? Right? And then he says, an enemy has done this. And then they say, look, do you want us to take it out? And then he says, no, lest while you are taking out the weeds, you, you take out the wheat also. Now, I, I only know this with silver beet. I can't use wheat as an example because I've never grown wheat. But I know when you plant silver beet, have you ever seen it sprout? What does it look like when it sprouts? It looks like weeds, honestly. And you can't tell the difference. When do you only tell the difference between the silver beet and the weeds? When it starts maturing, because then it, it takes its shape, right? You can tell the difference. So that's what is happening here, where he says, look, hang on until the time of harvest. So now we're going to read verse 37 for the interpretation of that little parable. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Okay, the reapers are the angels. There we go. All right. Now, I like that part where it says the harvest is the is the end of the age. There we go. The end of the age is the harvest. All right. So therefore it carries on and it says, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be where? At the end of the world. All right. It says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom. Now why do you think they're gathering out? If you look at in terms of oppression, the oppressors need to be taken out. What do we do with murderers in our society? Those of you considering voting, you're going to have to consider this because they're talking about it, about these principles, um, about what their ideas are about justice. Some say we want to put prisoners away, and some are thinking about counseling as an approach. So I want you to think about that. Where do you want the murderers, rapists, pedophiles to be is a good question. The harvest is the end of the world. So it says that the weeds are going to be gathered and burned in the fire when is the question. And we read that it will be at the end of the world. That's right. Because before then, you can't tell. You can't tell the difference. You got to wait until they've reached full maturity and then you will be certain. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah, there was a clear distinction between the righteous and the wicked. All right. Next question. If the wicked who have died... So, if it's at the end of the age, all right, what's the, the next logical thought is that are there weeds or wicked people being punished now, right now? Are there people suffering now just based on that parable? Right? No, no, no. I, I'm meaning in terms of God and justice in the earth. It says, all right, should we take out the weeds, right, so that they can be punished now? What does the parable say? No. It says because while you're taking out the weeds, you will take out the wheat also. So while you're trying to take out the wicked, you take out the righteous also. Let's wait until the harvest. Now, this is relevant for us today because it's not only... The wicked are not gathered in one place and the righteous in one place. Sodom, they had to just come out of Sodom and then you were safe. But in our case, we're blended everywhere, right? You don't know who your neighbor is. You don't know who the person lying next to you is, right? It says, one shall be taken from the two in one bed, the other left. 
So if there's fire on that bed, where are you going to end up? You know what I'm saying. That's why God has to wait until the harvest. All right. If the wicked then who have died are not in hell yet, where are they? Good question. Somebody. I don't want, give me the answer. Where are they? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary be at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They hear not the voice of the oppressor. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. All right, you see that, right? In the grave, it doesn't say those, the wicked that go to the grave are in anguish. It says, right? Mine says they cease, um, cease from troubling, all right? Okay, uh, I'll go on to the next one, right? I, I think that's sufficiently answered. Following on from the logic of the previous question. Now, what is the wages of sin? I'm not going to dwell on this question because you know it. Mm. The wages of sin is, is death. But the gift of God is... Now, if you don't mind turning to Romans 8, you might find a very fascinating verse there. And this is talking about the, the wages of sin or the end. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Does anyone have someone who was led by the Spirit who is dead today? Give me one example. David, Uncle Bill, right? How many people can you think of who are Christians who are dead? That verse says, if you... What does it say? If you live after the flesh, you will die. So what is the reward then? Is this talking about the death that we all die? Do Christians not die? No, we die. So this is saying that the punishment for living after the flesh is, is death. Is death. But if we are led by the Spirit, we will live eternally. All right. Okay, I hope that one, I, I thought that was a good one because it talks about death and yet we know we all die. All right. So that gives us two options, right? What are the two options? That's your next question. What are the two choices, two options that, that puts before us? There's a famous verse in Deuteronomy that says, I sit before you, Life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose, choose life. Now, I, I want to draw us to something that is probably really the reality here. The question is, what will happen to the wicked in hellfire? Now, I know where we're going to conclude it. But I want to, to draw us to what is really relevant for each one of us as, an indivi as individuals. Because what happens to the wicked in hellfire? I want to turn you to Hebrews chapter 10. Huh? Hebrews chapter 10. And I want to take you from verse 26, reading down from there. And I want you to have a personal reflection on this verse and think about exactly what it's saying to each one of us as individuals. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to verse 30. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' Lord died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, 
who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. Now the reason I brought up this verse is that, you know, when we think about hell and we use terms like the wicked and the righteous, I really want to bring this home and just have us contemplate on that reality that, you know what? The Jews were actually considered the righteous people by terminology, right? And the Gentiles, the wicked, right? However, for many of them, Christ said to them in John chapter 8, he says, you shall seek me and find me, where, and not find me. Where I go, you cannot come. And he says to them, you shall die in your, in your sin. So here when the Bible paints this picture, sin willfully, that's really the idea that, you know what? The last thing that each one of us wants is to die in our sin. Because the Bible says then nothing else can be done. It says there is no more sacrifice for sin then when you die in your sin. But a certain fearful looking on of judgment. Now all you're doing is waiting for doomsday. And so here's the encouragement in this. When we think of bully, bullied, oppressor, oppressed, right? God is saying to us that whenever we sin, it hurts somebody. And sometimes you may not know it, but I guarantee you someone is hurting because of your sin. And if you can't see that person, turn to the Gospels and see someone that it directly put on the cross. And just the same way you would feel seeing your son, your daughter being oppressed, bullied, persecuted. That's how God feels when we willfully do things because they hurt somebody, right? Stealing, killing. I'm sure you can see the logic here that killing doesn't affect you, does it? Hate may not affect you immediately but for the sake of those that are mourning and crying god has to yeah he has to repay and that's why we're given the opportunity to do what now you guys might know this it says agree with your adversary while you're in the way do you know that passage and what it's saying is that, you know what, when you hurt someone, what should you do so that they don't cry to God, right? Because why does God repay? Because they cry to Him. It says, agree with your enemy quickly. Why do you think it says quickly? Why do you think it says, agree with your adversary quickly? Why do you think it says that? <laughs> right? If you've stolen something from someone, you've hurt someone, what is it saying? Make it right quickly. Because the time will come when it's too late to make it right. And for those that are married, the Bible calls us to say, let not the sun go down on your anger. Right? Make it right quickly. Otherwise, the devil will gain the advantage because you may die in your sins. You know what I'm saying? So that's why for us, the words, it's a five-letter word. What do you think that five-letter word is? Should be precious to us. Ah, thank you. Sorry. Now, I'm saying this because I know in many relationships, you know, the word S-O-R-R-Y could do a whole thing lot of good, a whole lot of mending, a whole lot of healing, because the people are at rest. There's no cry in their heart for justice because you've made it right. And so even the murderer, I'm telling you, God is able to forgive a murderer. Why? Because he can say, I'm sorry. And even though you can't change some of the damage you've done, you can't change the past, but you can make it right. You can say, I'm sorry, 
and the person is not going to be crying out to God for justice. So that's my exhortation to you. The Bible says, do it quickly. Don't let your pride get the best of you. I'm saying this on a brotherly level, telling you, don't let your pride get the best of you. Because in the end, what seems like a small sin will cost you your salvation. Let it go. All right, what will happen to the wicked in hellfire, right? The Bible says, for the Malachi verse, for behold, the day comes and shall burn as an oven, and all that are proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. It carries on and it says, the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. You shall tread down the wicked. Now tell me, are we going to ever walk in a deep place in a bottomless pit called hell where we will be walking over the ashes of the wicked? Is there ever a thing like that? Is that where paradise is? Just above hell. What does it say? They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, if we take Sodom and Gomorrah as an example, right? Where will hellfire be? Could you turn to Second Peter just um, as an answer? And some of these verses are not in your study guide, but it gives you a, a bit of an inkling of exactly what the point is here. Where will it be? But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Okay. So we're talking here about what people consider hellfire. And it says, the earth which is now is reserved unto that fire, right? Now, if people say that hellfire is somewhere in the earth, and the earth itself is reserved for hellfire. So how can the earth be put into the earth to burn? Do you see the logic there, right? So the earth is reserved for hellfire. And so it will, it carries on here. Verse 10. It says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with the great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. And all these things, it says in the next verse, shall be dissolved. All right. So the where, where does the fire come from? If we think about Sodom and Gomorrah. It comes from heaven, that's right. Will the fires of hell ever go out? I've got some... Um, References here that I think will be beneficial to you. Now, I wanted to start in Jeremiah chapter 17. And I know we've got a few more questions, so hopefully we can be finished right on time. And really zone in on the purpose of Christ's teaching on hell. Why did he emphasize it so much? Because in reality, people may differ on the details that we're discussing. But the point of the teaching, what was the goal that he was trying to achieve in conveying it, will be the same. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 24 to verse 27. Now, I'll read this. Huh? I'll read Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 24 to 27. And then I'm going to ask you to turn to Second Chronicles soon after. I really want you to grab hold of this point. All right. We're talking about will the fires of hell ever go out? And the only reason we're getting into the details is because in a way it vindicates the character of God. Here we are. Starting with verse I said verse 24. And these are the words of the prophet, not mine. It says this, And it shall come to pass, if you diligently hearken unto me, says the Lord, to bring in no burden. I like the sound of that. 
through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein. Then shall they enter into the gates of this city, kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and horses. Doesn't sound very relevant now that we've got cars and trucks and planes. But the promise still remains for the people of God. He promises a blessing. It says, and this city shall remain for how long? Verse 25. Forever, forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin, from the plain and from the mountains, from the south, bringing in their offerings. And then verse 27 says, But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden. It's, it's amazing to me that we're almost being forced to relax. We don't want to relax. We don't want to offload the stress and the burdens. You know, and God's like, let go of the burden. And people are like, no, I want to carry it. Even entering into the city Jerusalem on the Sabbath day with the burden, right? What will God do? I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof. It shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. It shall not be quenched. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. And here's a lesson that we can take home. Second Chronicles, that's before Job, before Nehemiah. The last book of the kings of Judah. And I'm going to read these three verses for you. Now, now does everyone remember the verse we just read in Jeremiah? Right? He says, it shall not be quenched. Now, I want to give you a context of the time in which Jeremiah lived and what he was saying and what was going on here. We obviously know they were carrying burdens on the Sabbath day, right? And so, Jeremiah, uh, 2 Chronicles 36 from verse 14 reads like this to verse 16. It says, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their father sent to them by his prophets and his messengers, rising up the times, right? Meaning early and sending them because he had compassion on his people, right? He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place, but they... They mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words and misused his prophets. Now you see the idea here of the oppressed and the oppressor, right? They misused his prophets. And this might remind you of a parable Christ taught. It says, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. The wrath of God, there was no more remedy. In other words, what? What do you think that means to say there was no more remedy? There was no turning back now. Now I want you to read um, what ended up happening. Verse 19. Oh well, verse 17. Oh, oh, let's just carry on. Therefore, meaning... When there was no longer any remedy for the wrath of God, he brought upon the king of the Chaldees, Nebuchadnezzar, slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. He had no compassion. Who had no compassion? Nebuchadnezzar. God had given them all the mercy and warning they could, but they refused until God said, okay, you have your, you have your way. And Nebuchadnezzar, in contrast, came and had no compassion upon the young man, the maiden, old man, or whom that was that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God. Verse 19, 
They burnt the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burnt all the palaces with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And the rest were carried to Babylon. Verse 21, to fulfill the words of Jeremiah. Now, if you look in all the Bible, that passage we read is the only one that has direct reference to this part of Second Chronicles. And so what lesson do we get here? That you know what? As we learned the other week, God takes special interest in justice, in what is right, and that includes resting on the Sabbath day. Now, I'll tell you why the idea of oppressed and oppressor involves the Sabbath day. The children of Israel were slaves, and they were never allowed to rest. And God commands that even the slave should rest one day a week, right? On the Sabbath day is a day where no one is to bear any burden. Everyone is to rest from their labors. How serious does God take that issue? Not only of the Sabbath day, but of all his commandments. How serious? It says that his anger burns with unquenchable fire. Right? That's how serious it is. And it was fulfilled. Now, is Jerusalem burning today? Are you sure? No, I... Are you sure? The Bible clearly says unquenchable fire. And here we read that Jeremiah's words were, were fulfilled. Are you certain Jerusalem? I'm, I'm, I'm taking this verse from the Bible, you know. Are you sure? Or do we share the same map? You tell me Jerusalem is not burning today. Doesn't it say unquenchable fire? All right. Okay. It, that's right. That's right. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever heard the saying on the news when there's forest fires and it says the firemen are failing to put out the fires? Now, do the firemen carry the hoses to the places where the fire has already burnt and left ashes. Do they try and spray those areas like, man, they're failing to quench the fires? No. Which fires are they talking about? The ones that are still burning, right? So in other words, you want to quench something that you want to save. Why don't they quench where it's already been burnt? You know what I'm saying? Everything's burnt up. There's nothing to save. It's all gone. It's burnt up. You can't save anything. If you were burning, at what stage would you want to be quenched? When you are ashes? <laughs> would you want a complete job so you don't look partly burnt? You want to wait till you're ashes, then you're quenched. Or would you rather someone only when you're just touched, then it's quenched? The quenching is in order to save, right? You want to save. Let's quench the fire. If you quench after it's burnt up, what good is it? It's too late. I thought, I hope you can keep those verses actually because I think they're, they're very, very distinct and clear to understand. Now, we don't have any more time. This is about all we can do. So forgive me for us not closing off. But I want you to take you to Matthew 23 to close and then we're going to look at um, something significant there. Because, uh, yeah, we just, we just don't have time. Matthew 23. And here is the main point, because I guess sometimes the details can be very cerebral, right? We're, we're all up in here. And this is what Christ said. I'm hoping that maybe we can get a chance to talk about the rich man and Lazarus at another stage. We're in Matthew chapter 23. Now, if you remember the words in Jeremiah, the words in 2 Chronicles where God said he sent his prophets, right? And the people mocked them and persecuted them until, and the wrath of God was kindled until there was 
no remedy. I want you to read verse 37 and 38. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets, and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now here this verse paints a picture of how often what do you think he says, how often? How often, right? God is never not trying to draw us back to him, to turn us away from sin. And here Christ says, how often? Not just in one generation. Christ has been pleading with mankind generation after generation. What has been the response? Right? What has been the response? It says, I wanted to gather you, right, and your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but ye would not. Now, I'll tell you what. The Bible says God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. It says that hellfire is his strange act. But I want to convey something very real to you that, you know what? It is going to be the worst sight Mankind has ever witnessed. I have to put that to you just to see the reality of it. That when Christ said that concept of hell in, in Mark 9, and he was saying, you know, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. It's not trying to say it's going to burn forever and ever. But it's completely final. But it's painting a picture that there's no remedy. God has tried and we have refused. Right? And we not only have refused, but we've gone on and persecuted his people. That's why that happens at the end. Because God's people, it says, are going to go through a time of trouble such as was never since the beginning of the world. The Bible says that in that real gravity. Now, if people are going to persecute God's people at a level that has never been seen, and it says, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. How do you think God is going to feel when all he is doing is often, like it says here, trying to gather the world under his wings? How do you think he's going to feel? He's going to say, enough is enough. I've done all I can to gather you and you repay me by persecuting my children speaking against me, promoting corruption in the world, all the evil we hate, God is standing up against it and he's calling us to stand up against it. And the way you would feel is the way God is going to feel. And that's why when hellfire comes, there is no turning back. No one is going to quench it. And so I want to encourage you that you know what the Bible says? If you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. God wants you to enjoy eternal life. Take a moment to ponder that just before we pray. I want you to take a moment to think about eternal life, about a world without end. The Bible says where there will be no more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, right? All the fruits you can ever imagine, coconuts and pineapples. Yeah, lions won't be scary anymore. That's not a fairy tale. That's really what God is offering. And God is saying, don't sell yourself cheap for worldly pleasure. All right, we're going to leave it there. Forgive me for not finishing, but... It's, it's quite an enjoyable study when you see it in the right light because it says that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, we pray that you may help us, Lord, to respond to your plea to each one of our hearts to come, to come to you, Lord. The closing words of the Bible are the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let all who hear say, come. You are calling us, Lord, 
from darkness to light. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your demonstration at the cross of how much you are willing to do just to save us. Help us to respond to this great love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Now, I'm going to recommend this. I know it's a long study. Now, some of you may not have access to this, but for those of you that have internet, I want to encourage you to look up Christ Objects Lessons, chapter 21 on the great gulf fixed. It's talking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And there is such profound revelation there that I was just overwhelmed. And sadly, we just don't have time to cover it. It's going to be in a separate sermon, I think. But if you do have Christ Object Lesson, chapter 21, it's called The Great Gulf Fixed. And that really zones in on Luke 16. And you know, with all my thinking, I tried to understand it and I kind of got it. But once I read that exposition, it was just like someone just shining a torch in my dark head. So. Make the effort. You will thoroughly enjoy it. I promise you. All right. Thank you.